single result. And so that's the map phase and the reduced phase. That's, that's it in a nutshell. Obviously, it's a little bit more complicated than that when it comes to implementation. Um, but in essence, that's really what it is. And, and the reason why I think it's caused such a stir is um, it's able to scale so well. You can make use of all of the resources that you've got. <coughs> Um, being able to build web apps and, and run them straight out of React is, is pretty cool. It's something that the CouchDB guys have been touting for a little while because they're one of the few that could actually take um, web apps and drive them straight out of the DB and have a, a JavaScript style library that you can just reach in pull the data straight out of your web app with. Um, you're now able to do that with React. <coughs> um, and it's open source. So you can, you can read the source. It's pretty mind-blowing stuff. Um, you can contribute to it it on GitHub, um, there's also a paid enterprise version, and the paid enterprise version gives you a cross data center replication. So if, if your application is going to live in a single data center, um, for the most part, the enterprise version might not be necessary for you. Um, yeah, but if you're looking for cross data center replication, then the enterprise version is available, and the Basho guys are, uh, are around, excuse me, to help you with that. A couple of other things that, that it does have that I'm not going to be talking about because they're pretty good topics in themselves. Um, one is streaming MapReduce, so the idea there is rather than sort of letting your query run, and there's no single point of failure. In a lot of replicated or clustered databases, there tends to be a master node or a number of master nodes, and if you lose one of them or any of them um, or all of them, you know, the whole the whole lot's gone, regardless of what your non-master nodes behave like. Um, in React, that's not the case. Every single node has equal say, so you should be able to pull out any node. Um, You'll often see though in tutorials people refer to the master node and I think that's just a poor use of, of words. They should probably just say the first node that I spun up and the one that I can't interact with more than anything else. Um, so, but there is no, no master node um, and obviously that's pretty powerful as well because it does give you a little bit more tolerance than you would expect elsewhere. Um, adding and uh, removing nodes is really, really easy and it's, it's very quick. Obviously depending on the amount of data that, that you've got in your database, you know, having one node sort of ramp up and taking a share of the load might take a little bit of time, that's the case I think in any system. But the actual ability or the, the work involved in getting a, a node added to your cluster is, uh, is pretty minimal. <clears throat> Operationally boring is a term that I borrowed, I think, from um, one of the users in Re of React over in, over in the States. I can't remember who it was. But um, it's actually a really good property, right? Because often operationally boring, you don't really have to touch it. You don't have to really deal with it. Um, it just keeps going. And even when nodes are failing, particularly run on the likes of EC2, if anyone's running on EC2, you know what I'm talking about. If um, your nodes are, are constantly dying, until you, you sort of hit a real critical mass where a large percentage of your nodes are dead, this node's gone down, this node's gone down, and they say, oh, how, how many nodes, or has this one gone down, or whatever? No, okay, we'll call me in the morning and go back to this stuff, yeah. Whereas you won't get that in many other situations, which is, which is very nice. <clears throat> so depending on what your configuration is, what your application needs are, um, quite a few <coughs> nodes can die before you get no response out of your route cluster. Um, uh, this is something that I, I kind of coined, it's like a perfect metastorm of perfect storms is required to really bring the thing down in production. So uh, it's, it's got the ability to hot code load. Which is something you, you, I won't say you get for free with Erlang OTP applications, <coughs> but it's, it's something that Erlang OTP sort of promotes, is the ability to upgrade your software without actually having to bring it offline. Um, and I, I really like that idea. I'm, I'm surprised that in 2011, particularly as someone who owns a lot of money in, the, in .NET, I'm constantly stopping services and shutting down IAS and uploading more code and starting again. And everyone in the same boat, or is that just me? Yeah, it's the same boat. It just seems a bit odd. I mean, Erlang's been around since the early 80s and has the ability to just hot code load and you don't have to bring your cluster down. So, um, yeah, that's, that's a really, really nice feature and kind of proof of the pudding. Um, Preston Crab put this up on Twitter recently. Hot, hot updated React backend while running with full steam. So, um, I think this guy's got a fair bit of traffic and behind the scenes he's using React and uh, completely updated React thing to version 14 or 0.4. Um, without actually having to bring the system down. So that's, that's pretty impressive, in my view. That's the kind of thing that makes me excited anyway. And Creston Crabb, um, who is a doctor, I should say, um, he's spent a lot of his time in the Java world and, and recently built something with Erjang, which is like a, an Erlang version that runs on the JVM. Uh, it's a pretty impressive piece of kit. In some, some cases, it actually outperforms the Erlang VM. Not all, but in some.
So that's a, I think he won, won the Erlang User of the Year Award last year. A very, very switched on chap. <coughs> right. A little bit on, uh, on how React works. <coughs> so the design. Design is based on Amazon's Dynamo. So anyone familiar with Dynamo? Heard the term? No? Yep. Um, it's a pretty in-depth uh, PDF white paper. Um, I'm not going to pretend that I understand it. There's bits that I understand and I need to read it a few more times, I think, for it to sink in. But it's, it's about um, being able to configure the read and write parameters of your, of your system depending on what your system needs to do. So if your system is read heavy, you need to configure it so that it's fast for reads. It's write heavy, you configure it so it's faster for writes, that kind of stuff. So that's what I mean by the, uh, the tunable NRM, uh, sorry, NRW. These, these links, by the way, I'm not going to click on, but I put them here because when the slides are online, you'll just be able to click on them and, and download and have a look at this I'm talking about. Um, the NRW values, which we'll see quite a few in quite a few areas, not just in, uh, in the React space, but any sort of dynamo driven <coughs> excuse me, database. So N, N refers to the number of replicas or the number of nodes that are in your cluster. Um, that's what the data is going to be replicated across. R is the number of nodes in which you want to have respond with a successful read for you to consider the overall read to be successful. So if you query a uh, React cluster and you want to get some data out of it, you want to know that the data you're getting is, is fine. So behind the scenes, um, the R value is saying, we've got you know, so many nodes. Of those nodes, I want to get successful responses out of these, um, this number before I consider that to be a successful read. Um, and the same in W, but that's for writes. Yeah? OK? Um, there's a little bit of, of math around. It's not, not rocket science. But um, the idea behind having these, it gives you an idea of how much of your class will fail before reads and writes actually start to fail. OK? <coughs> so, uh, React is an eventually consistent database. And when you say that to a lot of people, particularly from RDBMS who love the ACID world, they, t they tend to get pretty scared, the idea of not having consistent data across their cluster. Um, so when I say eventually consistent, what, what I mean is it, it focuses on the the A and the P of the CAP theorem. The CAP theorem is something that Eric Brewer came up with um, around distributed fault tolerance systems, and it's got three properties. C stands for consistency, so that's about um, when you read and write data, you've got sort of some consistent global state across your cluster. Um, a is for availability, so you want to be able to read or you want to be able to write um, how, how much it's going to be there for you to do that. And partition tolerance, which is really fault tolerance, saying, you know, if I bring down nodes or a network dies, can it heal itself? Can it, can it get back up without you having to deal with it too much? So, in the case of React, it focuses more on A and the P, and not so much on the C. So that means that, yes, maybe in rare circumstances, you can get stale data when you're querying. But this is where your read parameters come in. Um, you know, if you're getting stale data from one node and not from another, then it'll sort of should rejig the work and try and fix itself up on the fly for you. <coughs> Excuse me. So, just to see where where it sits with respect to other DBs, is that clear? Can you see that? Is it possible to turn the lights down just a little bit, please, Charlie? Thank you. Um, I stole this slide off a, a blog by a chap called Nathan Hurst. So thanks, Nathan. Um, I, I like this because it kind of gives you an overall view of where a lot of the NoSQL and, and even the RDNS stores live with respect to the, the CAP theorem. So you can see. Our consistency and availability world over here, this is where IDBMSs tend to sit. Um, partition tolerance isn't something they're renowned for, let's be fair. Um, so a lot of the IDBMSs are sitting there. <coughs> the, I think the, the hot databases at the moment that people seem to be talking a lot about are things like MongoDB, um, MongoDB, Redis, Voldemort, uh, React, CouchDB, Cassandra, back as a document oriented database. But Confirmed with, uh, with some guys from Basho, and it's not, it's actually a key value store that can be used as a document or oriented um, store. So, yeah, that's where it lives. So, mm -hmm. cache, that's eventual consistency. So, we, we kind of don't have a problem using a cache. It makes sense to speed things up, no issues. But yet, we are eventually consistent. We could possibly have stale data when we read from a cache. It's exactly the same thing. Um, in all likelihood, 
the consistency attributes of React are still really fast that you probably won't notice a difference until things start breaking, until nodes start going down um, and they start to heal themselves. That's where you'll see consistency starting to, to waver a little bit. But for the most part, it's rock solid and you, you won't even know a difference. Not that I've got a massive system in production, but I certainly haven't noticed a difference either. Now, uh, Key Valley stores, or well, maybe, maybe React in particular, but I think Key Valley stores in general um, have this idea of, <coughs> excuse me, of, uh, of keys, which identify the value that each store. In React's case, you had an idea of a bucket as well. And a bucket kind of correlates to what we know as a table in a relational database. It's not strictly true, um, but a lot of people I think come from our DBMS worlds will look at buckets as, as a table, and um, that seems to make a lot of sense for people. But you can can use them for, for other things too. You may decide to put sort of any ad hoc data in the same bucket, it doesn't really matter. What it really is is more of a logical grouping um, data for whatever your application needs happen to be. So yeah, think tables and primary keys, but it's not really what they are. Um, React has this notion of, of links. Now links, links are metadata associated with a value in React. And that basically says I'm, I'm pointing to some other entity in my cluster. Um, and you can kind of see these as foreign keys, but they don't give you referential integrity. They're literally there so you can say, oh, I know that there's supposed to be something else that I can reference over here. It may actually not be there, but you have this ability of maintaining, uh, maintaining links across your entity so that you don't actually have to do things like create um, composite keys to try and figure out where other data is. You know, you know what I mean by that? I'm being a bit vague. So if you have an identifier for, say, person, and, uh, and you want to get um, an attribute of that person that might be, they have a, a wallet, they've got a wallet, and that wallet's stored in the database as well. And you know the identifier of the wallet, and you know the identifier of the person, you kind of combine the two together. To a bunch of individual Erlang applications all talking to each other running their own processes. So that's what I mean when I say it's a single Erlang OTP app. And it's something that you can take and stick in alongside your Erlang OTP app amongst a bunch of others. And they can just communicate as per any other sort of normal Erlang OTP communication mechanism. Uh, okay, some of the things that it's able to do. Now, I'll be honest, I glean most of this off the wiki um, at around one o'clock this morning, so it's not completely clear in my own head as well. But it's, it's pretty interesting to see what this, this thing can do. So it's got no management built in. It's, it's able to determine and keep track of what's going on on individual nodes that are happening across the entire cluster. <coughs> you can use it to programmatically add and remove nodes. Um, it's got an API for, for doing all kinds of crazy stuff, including um, advertising and locating services. So you might have a node that's that's capable of um, downloading RSS. You might have a node that's capable of running stuff on a GPU. And you want to be able to find what, where those nodes are and, and communicate with it. it, has the ability to do that. And it's got this, um, this idea of a gossip protocol, which it uses to talk across all the nodes in the cluster. And uh, it generates events based on what kinds of node activity so that these things can stay in sync. <coughs> Partitioning work distribution. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, so this, this first point is, is very buzzwordy to me. I don't exactly fully understand what that means. But uh, I think, in, in essence, it's, um, it has this, this notion of a master and a bunch of worker processes that are responsible for doing certain things. And that's how it orchestrates the activity that's going on a given node. Um, the idea of consistent hashing does come up a little bit, and we'll talk about that, I think, in a few slides' time. Consistent hashing is is something that's done um, to, it, it's a hashing mechanism, which allows you to come up with a value to index into a, into a hash table. But the idea of consistent hashing is something that's, um, it allows you to change the number of holes in your hash table without having the hash table rejig crap loads of data as a result of the changes. It's quite, quite cool and way too difficult for me to understand. Um, as I said, it's got an API for applies and locating, I don't know what that's in there again. It uh, deals with hinted handoff. Um, hinted handoff, again, we'll come to this, I think, a little bit later. The idea is, if you want to write something the right to fail, there's plenty of other nodes that you can potentially write to. So hinted handoff is about going, okay, well, I'm going to temporarily write that somewhere else. When the node comes back online, we'll just make sure that it's caught up. That's what hinted handoff, I think, basically means. 
Um, okay, so a V-node, and the V-node thing will come probably a little bit clearer in one or two slides time when I talk about the ring. Um, but the V-node is sort of this base level entity that's responsible for writing and reading information from a storage backend. That's where that lives. And you can create your own. And so with, uh, with React Core application, React Core V-node behavior, behavior is sort of an interface um, in the LN world. So you, you create a module that looks and smells like a, a um, React Core V-node, and it is one. You plug it into your React Core cluster and off you go. Is handled by this, um, this sort of core component, which uses this gossip protocol across the nodes to make sure that everything's in sync and it does all kinds of. So, um, as I said before, if you use React Core, anything above it, anything below it can be completely agnostic in scale. There might be some bleeding depending on how good or bad your plan code is. I think in my case it will probably be pretty bad. But um, it, it really does give you a good base on which to start. <coughs> right, so the ring. The ring. The ring is a 160-bit integer space, and that's basically the, the hash space. And so this ring um, is divided into a number of partitions, and that partitions vary depending on how many nodes you have, what your, your parameters happen to be. So virtual nodes, as I said, V nodes are virtual nodes. What they do is they claim a partition of the ring. They, they claim one block inside your hash tag. Okay? And so what happens when React writes a key and a value to the cluster, it hashes the key and you end up with a partition. And that's where it knows where to write the information. And uh, I'll cover that off in a little bit more detail in just a minute. Uh, so a cluster of V nodes live in a single React node. So you might have one machine running one instance of React and we'll have a number of V nodes behind the scenes all reading and writing data based on a particular block in that ring. Okay? Um, and each node in the cluster will have the same number of V nodes. Um, hence the same number of partitions. And this Thank you, Basho, again for your lovely imagery. Is um, is is the ring, um, and so you can see these these four things are supposed to be like your physical nodes. Think of them as physical nodes. They might be on the same machine. They might be on different machines. And you can see that these blocks here are the, are the V nodes rather than the, the full nodes <coughs> that live across the ring. And so that's how your your ring space might be partitioned. So what happens is the name of the bucket and the name of the key are hashed. And whatever that hash value is, a partition is selected, and that's where the data is written to. It's also replicated, um, which we'll show in just a minute. So that's that's in essence how the location of data is chosen. Okay, that all clear? Any questions, by the way? Is there anything you want to ask? No. Stick your hand up halfway through um, if you really want to. Don't mind being that does just write in data. That's the node that it will write to. And read from. Oh, okay. It needs to know where to, to get information from. <coughs> and the replicated bit is, um, is about having that sort of redundancy to make sure that they have the ability to read should that node go down. Okay? Um, so data is stored in the ring by hashing the bucket and key, as I've said, to determine which partition to write to. Data is written to multiple partitions based on the end value. So the end value says, I want, to go, I want this many, many nodes available, and this is how many. Um, Partitions I'm going to be writing to. So per node there's a default value, but that can be changed. So I think out of the box it's three. You have a right to um, that number of nodes is, is three. <coughs> but it can be changed and it can be configured per bucket. So per sort of logical collection of, of data, you can have different NRW parameters, sorry, N parameters. So this is how the data is replicated. Oops, sorry. So you put something into a given partition, and depending on the number of nodes, it will write to the following partitions. Now, they, you don't know exactly where they live. That's obviously handled for you by the likes of React Core and distributing work and, and whatnot. But that's, that's essentially how it works. Um, it knows where to write and, and writes in the following partitions. <coughs> Pardon me, sorry. Still got a cough. Does that make sense? Yeah? Yep. Okay, so what happens if a node is added or removed? And this is where consistent hashing really comes into play. I'm just going to fire up the Wikipedia definition 
of that. Um, so the idea of this, as I said, is to have a hash table that you can change the, the buckets of, the partitions of, and not have to rejig a lot of data as a result of the hashes mapping to a different partition. Yeah? Please? So that's, that's, I don't know how that works. I've tried to read the implementation in React and it's beyond me at the moment. Um, the theory is that by using consistent hashing, um, only a subset of keys will actually need to be remapped to different partitions. Um, and K is a number of keys, N is a number of slots. Which is pretty cool. Um, you know, hash, hashing is a hard thing to get right, I think, at the best of times. But the idea of, of having a hash that you can change parameters of and still not see data moving around too much is, is actually really, really amazing. It's another thing that I think is pretty... Um, so that hash is kind of the index? Yes. The yeah, the hash is the index that yeah. gives you yeah. um, the petition. Yeah. Exactly. <clears throat> so node failures are managed using hinted handoff, as I said. So hinted handoff is that I oh, will just tempor temporarily write somewhere else so that we can pick that information up later on when the node comes back online. Um, there's a bit more to it, obviously, than, than that brief explanation, but I think in a nutshell, that's exactly what hinted handoff is. Um, and that comes baked into React. So if a node dies for some reason, what happens is neighbouring nodes tend to pick up the pieces for them. Um, and then over time, when the node comes back online, they sort themselves out. This, to me, is what makes React so resilient, is that you, know, you, can, you can have a number of nodes die and all the other nodes around it are just picking up the pieces and as a user you really don't see any difference. As an admin you don't even see much of a difference um, until things really, really turn to shit. Um, but yeah, I think, I think it's pretty amazing. That's something that excites me at least. So ring state and bucket properties, along with the changes, are all propagated by this gossip protocol. That's what's keeping things in sync. And I've kind of reiterated that a few times, but um, it's, it's a pretty key thing. This little protocol, it's, it's really chatty, hence, hence the gossip protocol. The idea is just to make sure that everything knows what's going on and whether they need to update, copy some data, or take, take some map reduce workload on, or whatever it happens to be. <coughs> <coughs> Pluggable backends. So out of the box, um, you get something called Bitcask. And Bitcask is a mixture of Erlang and C code. And it's a storage engine, and it was written by, by Basho. When they, when React was, or well, when I was first made aware of React, the primary backend for it was something called InnoStore, which is similar to the storage engine used in MySQL. Um, and it's, it's really fast and really powerful, but for some reason, I don't think it was good enough for the React guys, so they came up with their own called Bitcast, and that's what's turned on by default. It's, it's amazingly quick, very, very quick. Um, and again, it's open source, so you can, you can browse it, fork it, do whatever you want with it. Um, you can change your storage engine per bucket. So if you decide, say, I'm going to have a bucket called session, and the session is where all the user sessions go from my web app, I'm going to stick that in an in-memory database. I don't care if it dies, but I lose a session, what do you do? I don't need to write that to disk. Okay? So in Erlang, you have something called ETS, um, and ETS is in-memory. So if, you, if your node dies, anything on that disappears. But for sessions, you probably don't care. You don't necessarily need to write that to a disk. So if you had a bucket with ETS as a back end, you're essentially getting something similar to memcache. Yeah? Everyone knows what memcache is? Yeah. yeah. Um, DETS is the file system version of ETS. Um, FS is, is um, just file system, flat file storage. You know, Store already said that was the one that came out of the box. Well, at least I'm aware it came out of the box. Um, when, when I was made aware of React, and that's the, the MySQL to my backend. GB trees is, a, I think it's an online specific thing, but I'm not too sure. And there are, there are others. And you can produce your own. There's a fairly consistent API for large storage engines. Again, similar to, to Vino, it's probably implement behavior, and off you go. Pretty amazing. Pretty amazing. Very, very nice plug one configurable system. Right. Um, in an eventually consistent system, you're going to have cases where people are writing information to different nodes and you don't know which one it is that's right. So um, I might be arranging to do a presentation for alt.net and I've talked to Liam about it and um, Steve's spoken to Matt about it. Okay, so am I presenting or is Matt presenting? You don't really know. That's the kind of problem that you're going to face when you're writing to different bits of information across a, a system like this. And so vector clocks are all about trying to manage that to determine 
which bit of information is the most current. And it's there not only to try and do automated repairs, but also to give you the ability to determine it yourself and perhaps function in a different manner. So I think usually what will happen is the latest vector clock is going to win. Um, it's like last right wins, basically. But you can handle that um, in your own way if you want to. You know, if, uh, if Steve has more authority than Liam, regardless of his vector clock, he's going to want to write whatever it is that, that's, um, that he decides. <coughs> so again, I think I'll just give you a quick definition of what vector clocks are. The idea is a vector clock will contain um, an identity of the thing that wrote it and some kind of timestamp. And as data gets written and written and written, this vector clock has more and more instances of this stuff so that um, you can tell what's touched it and when. And so the algorithm behind vector clocks um, uses this information to determine whether or not there has been some kind of conflict. And that's when it can resolve them. <coughs> OJ? Yes. If I want to use React, do I have to understand all this stuff? No. Oh, cool. No, you don't. <laughs> <laughs> no, you I'm not saying I wouldn't want to, but... No, 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 no you don't. It's a valid question. This, this was, um, Hello, world. It's, it's a very, very selfish set of slides. This this is the stuff that I find really interesting. So yep. if, if it's not interesting to you and you don't want to know, that's, that's completely cool. Um, so you don't have to know about this, but it's just... I, I wanted to show sort of how a lot of these things are, are resolved. And I'm not going to go into too much depth. It's like, this is what it is. If you want to know more about it, then please go and do some reading. But that's what, what they're using at the moment to, to manage this, which is pretty cool. Um, does that answer your question? Yes, no. thank you. Um, so each update to the value results in a new vector clock value, which contains this extra bit of information. Um, and comparing V clocks lets you determine whether one object was descended from another, whether it wasn't, or um, whether two updates kind of share a common parent. By parent um, or ancestor, I mean a given value changing in two different places at the same time. So I've updated A to produce B, and someone else has updated A to produce C. So they do have a common ancestor, and there's sort of time and what associated with that. So that's, that's what I mean by, um, by heritage. So, so do you have kind of a history of uh, like a the vector, audit, audit log? The, the vector clock, is, does, is, I don't think it's a full history. Yeah. It's kind of like the most current, oh, okay. the most recent. Yeah. And that's enough, I think, to be able to say, hey, this one supersedes that one. Um, and it's also what's used to sort of automatically heal. So in cases where you may say, right, I've, I've got a read value of three. I'm expecting three reads to come out of um, a database as successful before the read is successful. Now, you might get two come back with the same data and one say, yes, I'm successful, but it's actually got different data. And so behind the scenes, what happens is something called read repair, where Preout goes, oh, your data's out of date here, you need to update that while sending the information back to the, the caller. And I'll talk about that, I think, in a few more slides. Does, does that answer your question? Yeah, yeah. Yep. So that, that request might still see the old data if the, if, the, if the one out of the three was the most recent? Say that again, sorry. Yeah, you're just saying in that case, you get, you get three, three reads back, yep. two of them agree, the other doesn't. If the one that doesn't actually is the most current, Will, will, that, will that request see that, or will you just get the, the majority of rules in that request, but it will repair itself? Well, or whatever the most current is, is what you'll get. That's right. Okay. Um, depending on, on the VCOC. If the VCOC says this is actually some kind of conflict, then something else needs to happen, something needs to be resolved. But that probably will happen up front when the information is being made. Okay, so it's in time for that request? Yes. Yeah, okay. And so um, you might have three nodes saying, hey, I've, I've got this information at this point. And there's one node going, yeah, I've got this information and it's further down the track. If there's nothing to suggest that these three nodes have more say than this node, then the one that read successfully that is the most current will be what you get back. And the information will be re read repaired across the other nodes. Yeah. I think. <laughs> Sounds good. Yeah. So oh, it's funny. Sounds good. <laughs> <laughs> and I've been saying for now. Sorry? If nodes come up with stale data and they've gone down, come back up? Quite possibly, yeah. It could mean that one node's just lagging um, and they haven't replicated fast enough, depending on what your infrastructure is. Yes, this will work for them. When you're talking about uh, the parents or whatever that it knows where it came yeah. from, does that mean that when you're dealing with it in your client application, you actually have some sort of identifier to say where it read from? You can you can look at the um, VTAG itself and deal with it, but in most situations, it'll be done for you. You won't even know. So if you write something, it knows 
Yes. Well, because where you write, where, let's say you, you read some information, we'll see this a little bit later on, you read some information, you get the, the V clock with it. Oh, you get the V clock with it. You get the V clock with it. And so when you write back, you're saying this is the V clock that I'm updating, and that's how it's able to track back Okay. Good. Okay, more information about vector clocks. There's two really good blog posts there by, again, Basho, the guys that, uh, that did this. And there's a vector clocks wiki entry which kind of dives a little deeper. So if you're interested in this, Follow those links, they're really, um, really interesting. If you're able to understand large amounts of jargon, then go to the Wikipedia entry. Um, that's pretty enlightening for those people that can understand it. But those, those blog posts are really good. Uh, so, my, my view, what do they do? They help keep, keep shit in sync and help us figure out when shit places and when. Simple. simple. It's simple because someone else has written it for me. Read repair. So as I said, when, um, when you're asking for a number of reads to happen, and you might get a clash. Read repair is something that happens automatic, automatically. So you might find that a node is returning that it hasn't found that data, and so um, React will say, well, you should have that data, and here it is. Uh, and again, if the VCOCs are out of whack, again, there'll be some kind of auto healing going on there as well. <clears throat> so the word, the word quorum appears a little bit in, um, in the world of React. And it wasn't until I think you know, late yesterday that I bothered to really figure out what it means. And it's pretty simple. Um, so quorum refers to the quantity of nodes that must respond for a success, for a reader or a write to be successful. When I read that, I thought I should have read that a while ago. That would have cleared a lot of things up for me. Um, but it's ultimately a symbolic quantity for uh, an item that's calculated via this little formula. Um, <coughs> and the default value of that is, uh, is 3. So um, it's, it's a really simple buzzword, um, and that's really what it is. So saying if the quorum was met, so if the number of nodes that were supposed to respond responded, but data was different, we got different results, and read repair happens to try and get the information back in sync again. Do you ever get any um, model errors where the most up-to-date one was down for some reason, mm -hmm. and the two that were left over were out of date, they didn't know about it, and the quorum said yes, that's okay. Right. Absolutely, you will get the stale data then. Okay. And yeah. what happens when it goes to repair itself? When it goes to repair itself and the note comes back yeah. online, um, what will happen, I don't know whether it happens immediately or whether it happens when the next read occurs, um, but it will, when the next read occurs, try and heal itself across those, those nodes. The more interesting thing would, would be, let's say that node that had the latest information died and someone wrote the information. Well, that's what I'm you, you read to then, it, and then you then you've obviously back. got a, a conflict there. And so, by default, the, the mechanism for healing that problem is, well, the last one wins. And so, the, the very latest one. But you have the ability to, to manage this behavior. And it is a way of finding out. Because one guy wrote something. Yeah, exactly. Somebody wrote back. And, and if you think it about it, like too. You lost my data. Yeah, it, it does look like that. It does look exactly like that. We think that in a real world sense, what we do. So how would you, how would you well, know? I'm not just thinking. No, 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 no. How, how the system would work, but hmm. then I just wanted to prove to the guy that there was a system failure. Yes, yes, but exactly. I can identify that yes, there was a system. That's right. There is, there, and not my application that screwed up. Exactly, and I think the killer detail there is that you're able to identify that something has happened, and you can. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, is that, is that right? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So my question is, you can, you, you can, in that sense, you can, you can plug in your own. Yes. Um, Handling. The mechanism of Handling. how to handle that there. Yeah. <coughs> okay, so that's what read repair is. Okay, um, how am I doing the time? Uh, we got heaps of time. Yeah. So. Oh, really? <coughs> Go as long as you like, really. Yeah, excuse me. Mm. It's about 10 seconds. Right, so um, here's stuff that's probably going to be a little more interesting to people who just want to use it. Um, I'm going to give most of the examples, probably all of the examples, using the RESTful API, using client-specific APIs as a little counterintuitive, I think, for demonstrations. And with the RESTful API, we can really see everything that's going on, because I'll just be making requests using curl. So this, this is the format of, uh, of what your React URI is when dealing with reading and writing information. HTTP, like CTS, anyone you have it configured, it's got a host and a port, and then slash React is hard-coded. Um, and the reason for that is because the root level URI actually has meaning. There's a map reduced URI for where you actually run the queries on, for example. There's statistics and, and various other things. So when dealing with your data, it's slash react. Followed by a bucket, followed by key. Now, just briefly, the idea of a bucket existing um, 
is is not really right in the sense that a table may exist in a relational database. Like up front, you create a relational database table and you define some keys and various other things. In, in your app, you might have the idea of a bucket. But if there's no data written to that bucket in React, the bucket doesn't exist. Until you write the data, that's when the bucket then exists. Okay? And the key is obviously the, the key. Now the key, you can have React generated for you, or you can write your own. <coughs> okay, so, the REST API, as I said, is handled by something called Web Machine. Web Machine was again written by Bacho, and it, what it is, it's like a, a toolkit for writing really well behaved RESTful web applications. Um, and it's, again, it's a very, very nice piece of software. And so when you deal with React, you're dealing with, um, you know, HTTP, puts and posts and deletes and gets. So what you do when you're writing information to React and you know what you, you want that key to be, you put it. You put it to URI. If you don't know what that key is, or you just want React to generate it for you, you post it to the bucket. And the information you get back in the response says, this is the URI, the thing that I've written. So you can then use that, obviously, to query React after. And deleting, again, rather self-explanatory, and I'm not going to demonstrate that. To so the soldier's bucket with the identifier of black adder. Um, given that this is a RESTful API and that the key value store itself is agnostic of um, what you store, it still has the notion of content type because content type allows you to do certain things depending on what the content type is. So for example, in the case of MapReduce across JSON, you want to make sure that your value is JSON. So your content type would be application slash JSON. In this case, we're just writing raw text, so my content type header is going to have text plain. Yes, exactly. Um, I, I don't know about that. Um, quite possibly. It might, might behave in exactly the same way. Um, it may also vary depending on the size of the things you're writing. Um, but I don't actually know the answer to that. That's something I'll, I'll look into. Okay. Uh, so across the board, I'm going to use verbose logging in these curl statements. Um, this is what the curl, the curl command looks like. So I'm putting pretty much exactly the URI that I showed just then. Host port react. Soldiers is the bucket name and black is the key. Dash H for the header. Content type is text plane and D for data is Captain black. <coughs> Should have had Edmund in there. Sorry about that. Um, and so the output looks something like this. So this is the verbose logging curl. You can see it. it's connecting. It's, it's sending the put request to that location um, with content type and content name. And they're saying, we're good to go. I've written that information to that location for you. Okay. <coughs> Posts, um, very similar. The only difference really is that you have a post um, rather than a put, and you don't specify the key at the end of your URI. Again, text plane. Uh, command looks pretty similar. And the response is a little bit different. So here we're posting to React Solders. And um, the response we get is 201 created. So the entity's been created and a location is returned, which is the URI that allows you to get access to the data that you've just written. Okay. Pretty, pretty simple. Okay, so reading, reading data is obviously just using get. Standard HTTP get command is substantially shorter. I'm just using the example of, of what's just written to show what comes out. And um, you see some, some other interesting stuff here. So first one of note is the VPOC. So you, you write some, you read a value and you get the VPOC. When you write that value back, you need to specify that VPOC so that um, React knows exactly which value you're updating and at what, what point you're updating it from. Uh, you can see it's generating e tags and all this other wonderful stuff that's a pain in the backside to generate. Oh, I missed a break statement somewhere there. And you can see down the bottom here is the data that we, that's the body of the response, is the data that we work. So, one thing um, that I want to highlight here is this, this idea of links. So, this is what a, a link header looks like when you pull it out of React, and that's what we're going to look at in just a minute. So, the idea here is it's saying that this particular entity, belongs in this bucket, belongs in this um, URI of soldiers. Okay? <clears throat> Any questions? 
Are there any higher level libraries for the client? Yes. Okay. Yes, there are. And I'll list those um, in a later slide, if that's cool. Yeah, thanks. So, so what is the typical stuff? Obviously, you don't just put strings in there. You know, no. do you put the JSON or whatever? You need in, in it, what do you do? Anything. I am going to cover some of that off oh, as well. Okay. okay, so if I don't do a good enough, a good enough job of answering <laughs> yeah, that in coming slides, that. then okay. please hit me again, okay? Right. Thank you. Oliver, yes. if you uh, issued the get command again, would the e tag be the same? Yes. Yes, it would. Unless behind the scenes someone's updated that, yep. then you'll get a different intent, yes. Okay, so as I said earlier on, uh, links let us form this sort of loose relationships between entities. They're not true foreign keys, and they give you referential, referential integrity. They're a, a reference to uh, other information. The cool thing about this is that you can actually walk links, and you can walk links using the RESTful API. Um, you can find what data is connected to what. So, for example, if we had um, Blackadder, and we have Lieutenant George, and Blackadder is Lieutenant George's superior. Um, Lieutenant George is in turn superior to Private Baldrick. Um, what we would want to do to actually establish this relationship is write a link header when we're creating our entities. So the link header takes this form. React again, bucket and key. So it's, it's just a URI of the thing that it's related to. And it's got this React tag here, which is just an identifier that says kind of what that link means. Okay, and that's completely up to you what it is you want to use. You might say, um, well, I'll show you an example and it will make a little bit more sense. Command for the three puts that I've just explained. Um, so I'm, I'm putting each of these entities here. And you can see here that um, I've got this header, header here. So what I'm saying is that George is Captain Blackadder's underling, for example. Now note how I'm creating this reference that George doesn't yet exist. So this is, this is what I'm saying. It's not actual reference to integrity. It's a reference somewhere else. So even if that thing doesn't exist, updates to an object happen. So it does, it does get bigger, but there are facilities to manage its size. But here you can see is the, um, the, the link tags that I'm talking about. Um, we're pointing to George, who is an underling, and the built-in one, which is pointing to the bucket that it belongs to, with the tags and whatnot. And there's our content. So, OJ, you talked about being able to walk that yep. through through the, the link tags yep. you supply. Separate get requests every time, there's no... No. <laughs> I'll just click the next slide button. That's what I prefer. <laughs> <laughs> it's like I placed you in the world. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Steve. Thank you, Steve. Trying. Very good question. I'm very glad you asked. Um, so, link walking, in, in the RESTful interface at least, you can literally whack the link walk that you want to do on the end of the URI. So, pretend that we have all that HCD blah 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 soldier slash blackout happening. And then on the end goes, goes this. This is the link walk <coughs> structure. So, there's three components bucket, tag, and keep. Um, keep is a, is a flag that says, as I'm doing my link walks, the data that's associated with the entities I'm walking across, I do or do not want to have returned. So, see? that keep flag for you, if you want to, let's say you're walking down four links, um, for each one of those steps you can say, I want that info, I don't want that info, I do want this info. And what you'll get is a multi-part MIME response with all of the detail in it, which you'll see in just a moment. Um, the tag is the name of the tag, of the link, um, and the bucket is the bucket in which this thing is in. And these things are kind of mutually exclusive, except for keep. Um, keep is more of a sundry thing, but bucket, bucket and tag don't have to be tied together. So you might say, I want um, anything associated with this object that has this tag. You might, want to, might say, I want anything that's linked to this bucket. Or you might want to say, I only want things that have both this bucket and this tag. So the tag might be um, underling. And underling tags can exist in the soldier's bucket and they can exist in the um, enterprise information technology department bucket. And obviously they're the same tag, but they kind of have different meanings. So if you want to make sure that you're looking at soldier underlings, then obviously you can put bucket um, as soldier and underling as the tag. You can put underscores for each of those parameters, which gives you some defaults. Underscores um, in bucket means giving any bucket. Doesn't matter what bucket it's in. Underscores for tags, again, doesn't matter what the tag is. And um, if you specify underscore, underscore for key, that just means I'm not interested in the information. It's the same as having zero for the key flag. Okay, so I'm, I'm going to get out of this and just show you this in the console because um, 
not showing it in the console was too painful for copying and pasting um, stuff. Now, is that, can you see that? I need to make it a bit bigger. Bigger. Sorry. Is that big enough? Yep. Yep. Okay. Clear? Right. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Excellent. Right. So um, I've already loaded the, the data in um, into our cluster. So hopefully this stuff should just work out of the box. So demo one. Um, looks like this. Now I'll just show you what the request is. So here we can say we're getting get soldiers blackout. Okay, so what this is, is I'm getting Blackadder without any link walking. I just want Captain Blackadder as he currently stands. As you can see, I get Captain Devin Blackadder. Nothing too special, that's exactly the same as what we've seen already. So demo two is slightly different. So what I'm doing here is I'm saying, please give me, um, uh, where are we? Blackadder no link walking. Did I just run the same demo again? Yeah, scroll too far. I scrolled too far. Uh, idiot. Yes, we did. Here we go. So I'm saying, please give me all of Blackadder's underlings and return me the data. So what we can see here is we've got this um, multi-part mixed response, and we can see that Lieutenant George is the underling. So you could have had more than one underling? I could have had more than one underling. And I'm going to show you a little bit um, again in a minute, because these guys also have capabilities, and I'll show you how you can actually you'll get multiple values back out. So that's just a single value relationship. In the case of demo three, which okay, so what I'm saying is I want to see all of the wit that Blackadder has, including the content. And so there's multiple responses here. So as we can see, he's got a one-liner, which which is I'm I'm a bit of a Blackadder fan, in case it's not <laughs> <laughs> not noticeable. But that's that's a, a quip that I absolutely love out of um, out of one of the Blackadder goes fourth episodes. Um, and here's the other one, which is a two-liner, and there's the phrase there. I don't know how they come up with this stuff, but it cracks me up almost every time. <laughs> so, are you not finding the bucket in those requests? Yes, we are. Oh, sorry, no, I'm just referencing the tag. That's, that's all I'm interested in, is the tag. You'll see, I think I've got a, an example where I'm just using the bucket. Okay. So that's like if I had um, relationships pointing to other buckets, then they would also appear in this. If I wanted to limit it to, to, to just wit, then I need to specify so wit. You could as a bucket for each season and then get to wit. Yes, season. exactly. Exactly right. Okay, I think I've got another demo. Um. <laughs> okay, so get the fears of the underlings of Blackadder's underlings. So we know that Blackadder has an underling of George. George's underling is Baldrick. And Baldrick has. Is. Um, and so our request uh, is this blackout. I want his underling, but I don't want the data to come back with it. I want his underling, but I don't want his data to come back. What I want is his fears. Okay? And give me the data for that. So that will respond with, um, with two things. First one is a link to an equipment store. Oh, sorry, um, this is the entity that's been this returned. So he's got a fear of wit. Bald Baldrick has a fear of wit. And the content of that wit, for example, is a sharp tongue. So that's what that's what wit is. It's pretty cheesy, I know. So Baldrick is scared of sharp tongues, and he's also scared of sticks, which are brown and sticky. So that's an inspiration. At the end of um, the, the very final episode of Black Adam, where, where George is about to walk out and go over the top. Have you guys seen this? No. And um, he walks out, and Black Adam says, Lieutenant George, you forgot your stick. And he says, ah, thanks for reminding me. I, I would hate to face a barrage of German guns without this. So that's, a, that's why I thought I'd put that in there. And I think there's probably one more. I don't know what I'll do this time. So here we go. I'm, I'm going through it now and I'm saying, I'm navigating the same tree to the wit, but now I want all the instances of wit that that person is afraid of. So you can see I'm going underling, underling, fear, wit, and I'm, I want the wit entry. So here I'm specifying the bucket just to show that I only would want the width specific stuff. So give me the entries, all of the entries in the width bucket and um, give me their content. So I end up getting back the, um, personally I thought you were the least convincing and, and the other one, where are we? 
That's not going to be anything around here that's very small with the. Uh, and I think that's it. Okay, so that, it's quite quite powerful how you can just constantly add different um, link walks on the end and you end up getting your content back. Um, does that answer your question, Steve? Mm -hmm. Yeah? If those links uh, don't exist, yep. does he just ignore them and <coughs> go? Or does it tell you that they... Let's find out. Um, <laughs> what do you use? Pico? <laughs> Emacs? I'll just turn this into something that it really shouldn't be. Um, so let's say I'm looking for foo bar and one. Let's see what that does. Okay. I'm still I'm still getting the, the content that I asked because I didn't change that back to um, to zero. So I get an okay response. But it looks like I get an empty multi-part thing at the end indicating that there's no content. Yeah? Thank you, I just learned something. <laughs> okay. Have now, Sorry? Will it have now created any tags for you? No. It won't have to do this No, it wouldn't have. It's just purely querying. Yeah, I would have to put for those things to appear. Yeah, all post. <clears throat> It doesn't show you which one you're going to comment. Or who it does. does. Oh, yeah, so it's in the order. Yeah, it does show you in the order. Okay, so is the link walking clear? Um, depending on the client that you use, the link walking interface is a little different. Um, some clients, I think you walk the links and you don't get the content back. Um, I think that at the moment is, it's one, I think one of the issues is that across all of the clients that are available, they're all open source, so they're not all consistent. I'm building one, even to show you how inconsistent they can be. So we're on to MapReduce. Um, I kind of covered off the, the overall definition of this, so if that's not clear, stick your hand up now. All good? Righto, so as I said, key value stores tend not to have any functionality beyond storage and retrieval based on a key. So if you want to query the data inside, you, you don't really have that many options. So MapReduce is something that comes with React Web, which allows you to sort of peek inside the data and actually do something meaningful with it. And it's pretty powerful. Um, these first two points are kind of paraphrased from the wiki. Um, you can read a much more eloquent description on the Basho wiki, so I suggest that you do that. Um, so why, why do they have to use MapReduce, or why did they use MapReduce? Um, ultimately, it suits databases like RIP, um, which are sort of functional in nature and distributed. Because the idea with MapReduce, and this is what um, Google were talking about when they first coined the phrase, is you know, we've got so much data, and, and we do a lot of computation on this data. But what we seem to do in, in the IDMS world is we pull the data of the computation. So we have all this crap coming across the wire, and we crunch it, and we chuck it away, and then return the result. And MapReduce is about taking the computation over to where the data is, which is obviously a much more efficient thing to do. Um, and so you do the computation where the data is and you return just the results. And if that result set just happens to be the data, you haven't really lost much. Yeah? Only a tiny little bit of overhead in doing the math phase um, initially. Um, the beauty of it is you get kind of parallelism out of the box, particularly when you're mapping across all different <coughs> nodes. There's no reason why you can't crunch data on all those nodes at exactly the same time. So wherever that data is stored and replicated across the cluster, that's where the work is happening, which is great. Um, anyone, I know a few guys went to Yale this um, in December. People, so that did you go and see Eric Myers talk on those people? Yeah. That's great, wasn't it? And I love this um, how how you kind of highlighted in a really nice way that the, the NoSQL crowd are using MapReduce because the maths dictates that that's really the only option they have. Um, I have absolutely no idea how to justify that. All I can say is that he was very convincing and I'm a believer. Um, <laughs> I also like him calling kick it off and it will distribute a load and manage it. All the nodes can do the, um, the map phase um, at their respective points, but the reduce set tends to be done at the node where the request is made. Now the ubiquitous example of map reduce is doing word counts. So if you had um, a document, or a few documents, or a few hundred documents spread across your cluster and you wanted to do basic work counts, how many, how many instances of black are there, how many instances of boundary. Um You can do a map phase, which goes from counts all those individual words, and the reduce phase is aggregating those counts. Um, it's, it's one of the easiest examples to understand. I'm not going to use that as an example. Um, 
because it is a little bit boring. I'm going to rip off somebody else's. <laughs> <coughs> so, uh, when you actually execute a MapReduce job, it will vary depending on the client. I'm going to be using um, the, the JSON RESTful interface again. Using the Java client will look very different, for example. Um, in the case of MapReduce, the data that you're mapping over needs to be in a format that your query is able to handle. So if you're doing MapReduce through the RESTful interface and your code is JavaScript, then it's going to have to be something that JavaScript knows how to deal with. So most of the time that means JSON. It can mean text plane. It can mean basic supporting code garbage if you wanted to. Um, so long as it's, it's in a format that you can handle. So for example, if, if I was storing data out of my Erlang application, I could write Erlang binaries and I can do Erlang MapReduce over those binaries, but doing a JavaScript MapReduce over an Erlang binary might be a little bit painful. But I highly recommend that you don't do that. Um, if you do do that, open source it because it would be great to read. <laughs> Excuse me. So um, in this case, we'll be, we'll be using JSON data. So when you do MapReduce queries, you're posting to the MapReduce, MapRed um, URI in your cluster. So that's where that sort of slash rig app goes away and slash MapReduce comes back in. Um, MapReduce jobs in the REST interface have to be specified as a blob of JSON. Um, and this is, this is the form that it takes. You have a set of inputs, you have a definition of a query, and you have a timeout. Um, there is a default timeout of 60 seconds for a MapReduce query. You don't have to specify it. If you do, obviously, it needs to be in milliseconds. We'll dive into um, inputs and, uh, and query. <coughs> so map inputs can take one of three forms. One is just the name of the bucket. And when you specify the name of the bucket in your input, what you're saying is, I want to process every key in this bucket. Behind the scenes, depending on how much data you have, that could be a bad thing. Because listing keys in React is slow. Um, and I'm going to re-emphasize that a little bit later on, but it's slow. So if you're going to parse an entire bucket, the first thing you'll do is get the keys. It's going to list all the keys, and then it's going to do that reduce job. The other, another option is to specify um, bucket and key pairs that identify the individual entities that you want to map over. Okay? Obviously, you need to know what they are up front prior to running the job. Um, this third example, third um, case, is exactly the same as the second. The only difference is that you can specify one argument per entity. Okay, so that, that data that I'm showing you here, that, that can be anything that you kind of want to pass in to the MapReduce function, so sorry, to the map function, um, so that it can use that alongside processing that key. Okay. Um, it is pretty common to see just a bucket spe specified. As I said, that, that lists the keys and that's an expensive operation. Um, in a lot of cases, the buckets tend not to be that big. It's only when you're dealing with massive amounts of data that you really see, um, you really see pain. The map query, um, <coughs> you basically what you're doing is you give it a list of phases. And then by phases, I mean sort of stages in which you, you do your computations. You can have multiple map phases, you can have multiple reduced phases. So you might want to simply break up your functions into different math phases. So you take the output of one math phase and you throw it into the input of the next math phase, etc., etc., etc. And at the end, you then throw the result of that map into your reduce. Now, map and reduce look exactly the same as far as their structure is concerned when you're defining them in JSON. Um, they obviously just have slightly different meaning. Link should hopefully be obvious by now, but that's to do with link walking. Okay, and so behind the scenes, um, magic happens with, with this particular link query when you do that stuff on the URI to walk the links. Um, so, as I said, map and reduce phases share the same format, but map, map phases extract parts and process data one key at a time, and reduce phases aggregate the work that's done on those inputs. Does that make sense? Kind of sounds a little buzzwordy. Does that make sense? Ah, excuse me. So phase functions. Phase functions are, are the functions that get executed on a given phase, and they take three arguments. Um, the value that has been pulled out of the, the store based on the input that you gave. So if you specify the name of the bucket for your input, it would be um, the, va the first value that was extracted based on um, the first entry in the list of keys that were extracted from that bucket. The key data is, is something that you passed in 
alongside your inputs when you use that third option, you have the key, the value, and the data. So that key data is that third argument that's coming through. Arg is a static argument that's used across the whole phase. So one of the inputs that you specify when you do your map um, is the third, third or fourth parameter is a hard-coded argument. So you might have like a mini data set or a blob of JSON or just, just some kind of reference information that you want to pass along with the query and that's exactly what ARG is. So that will be the same for every single instance of that function execution during the, the phase. Um, I've got some simple examples here, again lifted from Bash's wiki because they do a great job of this stuff. Um, <coughs> so this, this is the most simple example of a map phase that you'll see. Is that big enough? Yep. Everyone can see that? Look at that me standing in the way. What this does is we're saying um, this particular map phase is using JavaScript. The source of the um, JavaScript function is this. And you notice that um, the function is only taking one parameter. And those people who are seasoned JavaScripters will know that that's OK. And the, the last two parameters are just ignored. Um, so you can have, have the function just take one parameter. And the, the parameter that's passed in first is the value. And that's the one we're really interested in. So here we're just returning the value. Um, and that value is not actually the value of what's stored, it's the entire React object, metadata, blocks, links, the works. Okay. If you want to actually get to the content, you need to do something extra, which I'll show you in just a minute. So that's the most simple thing. That's basically saying, give me all the data and all the metadata out of this bucket. Simple. Um, pardon me. Execute a map function located at a given URI. So you can. You can store, map, and reduce functions inside React as um, JSON documents. And then during your map and reduce phases, you can say, I want you to use that document over there for this phase, please. So what this is saying is go to the my.js bucket, which is where you're storing all your JavaScript, for example, and the my map key contains a JSON blob, um, sorry, a, a JavaScript function that I want you to run over um, the data in this map phase. Keep, keep is an extra parameter that says is exactly the same as what we're doing during phases. Do I actually want the information returned as part of the data that comes back? Um, Built-in functions help handle data. This is the most obvious one. Um, so react.mapValues.json says I'm going to give you the React object that came out of the data, uh, came out of the bucket during my map phase, and I want you to just give me the value that's stored in it as a JSON. So if you store um, some JSON, Re um, React Map Values JSON will give you that JSON in JSON format, not just a string. Okay. So you move because I was not seeing the web. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Sorry. Right Never had of doing that. Um, it can also call our language module functions as well. It's kind of beyond the scope of that. It's just nice to know that you can do. That. You just specify the module and the function, and off it goes as long as it exists. Okay, so I'm going to duck back to the console um, for the young demo. Um, I'm going to thank Sean Cripps for this. Um, I assume he was the one that created it, he's the one that presented it online. Um, and it's just a nice way of showing some of the options instead of me coming up with more cheesy things like the black hatter option, I decided to go with something that's a little more tried and true. So, what this contains is a set of data on Google Stocks, um, and these stocks have already been pushed into this React cluster. So I'm running a, just a two node React cluster because my VM is running like a dog and the third node is kind of bringing it to its knees. Um, so I'm running a two node React cluster and <clears throat> all of the, the Google stock information that I need for this demo is currently stored in it. Now these JSON documents contain the, the MapReduce um, queries that I want to run. And I'll show you what they are. They're actually part of the output when I run these demos. So, Simply echo all the values that we find. Now this might take a while, um, so I may I may cancel it. But this is essentially doing what that very first um, example does, um, only it's doing the React Map Values JSON at the same time. You can see it's really very slow. Um, so what you will you will end up getting is it's just a there you go, massive JavaScript array, JSON array, and you can see see the values that come out: date, open, high, low, close, volume, blah blah blah. There's one entry there. And so we get a full listing of the data that came out of the bucket. Um, it might actually be slow because the number of nodes that I've got are different to the number of uh, the end value that I've specified. 
so that might be causing some problems. Anyway, so as you can see, the query that was run here, I said I want to go over the Google bucket, Google, and my query has one map face, which is JavaScript, and all I want you to do for that value is give me the JSON that comes out of it. Yeah, makes sense? Mm -hmm. Pretty simple. I don't think the other queries are as slow as that, so sorry. Here we go. So here I'm getting the maximum high sell value I'm getting. Sean's getting the maximum high sell value for the first week of January. So you can see that's pretty quick. So what I'm saying is give me all of the entries um, in January that I'm interested in and run this function which basically says get the, the JSON document out <coughs> pardon me, and return the highest value. And there's a reduce function. Sorry, one play. Um, <laughs> return, return the highs, and then in the reduce phase here, you can see that um, we're just calling reduce max. Now, reduce max is actually a, a built-in React function. And you basically give it a set of data, and it will find the maximum value in a set. Sorry, I've been doing that a lot, standing in the way. Um, that that one's pretty simple. Makes sense. Yeah. Again, the data of i is that also else per month. So go across um, the months and look at the maximum values for each of the months and then return a set which contains those values. Um, this is obviously going to take a little bit of time. I think this goes across the entire bucket as well. Um, yes, it does. So yeah, it's a bit, bit more of a complicated query. This is why I wanted to show it. Um, this stuff should all look pretty boilerplate by now. Um, function key, pdr Again, pull the JSON content out first into the variable called data. And then we're just going to pull the month out um, based on whatever the identifier or the key of that particular value is. That's just doing a little substring pulling bits out. Um, and then what we're doing is we've got a JSON object and we store the value of the month and, sorry, in, inside the value for the month, we return um, the high for that particular month. And then we return that object. And then that means that for each one of those entities, we can, we can use the month as a key into multiple objects to do our reduce, as we can see here. So when we go values.reduce, we've got this callback function, which is the accumulator and the item. And then what we do is we go through the months and we say, if the month value that we're currently looking at, sorry, um, that we've accumulated up until now, is... Um, less than the one that we're currently looking at, then we'll take the one that we're currently looking at, otherwise we'll stick with the one that we've accumulated. And if it's not specified, sorry, I'm leaning again. Um, if it's not specified, we'll just take um, the one that we're currently looking at. It's not a particularly easy format to read, sorry about that. So and basically then, it's going to create an array for every entry that's a array entry for every entry in your bucket. Yes, so so this, this object <coughs> here is just a, a hash which contains um, a key being the month and, and the height for that month. And then when we reduce, the accumulator becomes one, one object. And so the first one that comes in, because it'll be blank, um, where are we? So if the accumulator for the month exists, the first time around it won't. So we'll end up specifying that the accumulator for that particular month is the item um, and month that we're currently looking at. And then the next time around, this may or may not exist, depending on which month it is. And we will assign whatever the highest value is, is um, out of the one that we've already got for that month and the one that we're looking at for that. And then we store that in the dictionary. And that's what we end up um, returning here, return the accumulator as part of that phase. And then at the end, we end up with this blob of, of JSON up here, which has the months and, um, and the highs for that month, the highest for that month. Is that clear? Yes. So is the reduce phase distributed? Um, it happens on, Just on the one. node that you did the request on. Yeah, the, the reduce phase is not. As far as I'm aware, it's not distributed. Um, I wonder if it's actually possible to do a distributed reduce. You Depending on the function, you probably could. I would have thought you need a function that would take two accumulators if you want to do a distributed Two accumulators? Well, you're reducing a one value. So your accumulator would be that one value. What would you use the second accumulator for? Uh, it, for when I wanted to merge, <coughs> uh, I'd run it on two nodes and then merge to accumulate. Oh, okay, I see what you're saying. We see that would be fine depending on the operation that you're doing, but not all reduce phases 
are able to work in parallel, right? Map phases tend to be a reduced phase of movement. In this case, where we're doing sums and the highest, I completely agree, you probably could. With a map phase, you can, the function can only ever handle one object at a time, right? That's right, yes. And the arguments that you pass it. Okay. Yes? How flexible is the JavaScript that you pass in? Like, could you build up a set of JavaScript functions of the library of common things? Yeah. How would you reference that? How would you reference them? Um, I'll just quickly whip back to this. This is basically how you would reference them. So you could you store these things in um, in buckets. Or are you talking about inside the actual map yeah. thing itself? So you'd have a function blah, and you want to execute some other function. I don't know the answer. Like call another JavaScript. Yep. Blah, yep. I understand. Store in another bucket. Like yeah. Well, I, given that it's actually JavaScript, you can probably do AJAX requests and through the RESTful API. Pull <laughs> <laughs> cool, yeah. I'm not condoning it. I'm just getting an answer. Okay. Um, so that, that could be one way that you do it, but um, the, the true answer to your question, I don't honestly know. Um, but I will, I'm, I'm interested to find that out myself, so I'll, I'll find out and I'll send an email to the list. Okay? It's um, a good question. Is it possible in the um, queries to actually be bucket agnostic? So, I mean, you're, in all your queries, you, you, you specify in your bucket. Is it mm -hmm. possible to just say, well, I really don't care if it's in, in one big bucket? Um, Again, I can give you a cheeky answer to that, and, and that is put everything in one bucket, and, name and bucket. you get exactly what it is yeah. that you're talking about. Um, but the real answer is no, I don't think you can make your map phases and reduce phases agnostic of the bucket. You have to specify the bucket in some way. It doesn't have to be the same bucket for everything. Yeah. So can you query to find what buckets you've got? Um, you can list buckets, yes. Um, I don't currently know how you do that, but there is a, a, a React application I'm going to show you shortly which actually does do the bucket listing. Um, and the source is available online. We've even got the source here. So, so you kind of have to know what's in those buckets as well, really. Yeah, because the idea of a bucket, again, doesn't exist until you've got data in it. Um, so I don't exactly know how you would reference um, the buckets themselves. But the, the source of this app will, will tell us. So if we've got time, we'll dive into that and we'll have a look. OK? <coughs> Five days when the hive is over, hmm, that's obviously a typo. There's probably going to be quite a few of those. Um, I think it's supposed to be 600. Anyway, I'll probably stop at this because there, there's a couple more demos and it's basically the same thing. Um, hopefully by now you can see what the structure is and you can see it, it's actually quite powerful. Um, there you go. Greater than 600. So there's quite a few, surprisingly enough. Um, Google, even uh, they're obviously fairly loaded. Um, but yeah, just, just another example. Um, I'm not going to go in there anymore because it's, it's, it's boring. Yes. Is there a transform function that can be called after your reduce? Is there a transform function? So, salt. Oh, okay. Yeah. Well, you would do that during your reduce. In your... Yeah, you would do that. Well, I think that's what, what you would do. I don't know. I mean, what you could, what you could do is um, maybe make that a separate reduce phase. But I think it would be basically another phase that is doing that extra bit of work yeah. for you. Yeah. Oh, so you can chain another reduce after that. Oh, yes. Yeah. Yep. Yep. You can chain maps and, and reduces and links and can, as well. And can, you, can, you, can you mix it up? Uh, what, do a map and then a reduce and, and then a map and then a reduce? Yeah. I don't think so. But I don't know. I don't know if it makes sense. Yeah, I'm, I'm questioning that too. But it's, it's worthy of chasing up. <clears throat> okay. Where are we at? A couple of things to look out for. I think I mentioned these already. Listing keys and buckets are expensive, so only do it if you if it's absolutely necessary or if you know you've got a small amount of data because it is it is going to be slow. It's a common thing though um, for you to want to be aware of the indexes, uh, be aware of the keys that are in your bucket, and React obviously doesn't make that easy. Um, and a, a common solution is to have something else that manages those keys for you. So you might have an in-memory bucket that stores all the keys. I don't think that's a particularly great solution. Um, most of the time, from what I've read and from the people I've spoken to, they tend to use Redis to, to do this. Is anyone familiar with Redis? Heard of Redis before? I know almost nothing about Redis, but um, it's an extremely fast in-memory database. <coughs> Excuse me. And it's often used alongside React to manage keys. Um, it's got indexes and various other things. So, so, oh, Sorry? 
It's not a NoSQL. It's not a NoSQL. It's not a NoSQL. Yeah. Yeah. Go for it. Go for it. You can knock yourself. So, if you're doing map that's going to use every thing in a bucket, it's still cheaper to supply a list of keys? Yes, I think so. Because the first thing it needs to do is find what keys are there. If you already know them, then it doesn't need to search for the keys. It doesn't need to pull the keys out before doing the map phase. Okay. Yeah. Uh, MapReduce job with bucket name, as I said, map reduces over the whole bucket, so therefore it's listing keys. So a couple of things. Okay, so the clients that are available. REST, obviously, you can use a browser. Uh, most browsers do make a lot of the HTTP handling painful unless you're using um, Tempered Data or something like that. Um, using curl or a language-specific HTTP library. So there are RESTful implementations in Java, um, Python, and a few 